Hi, I'm Greg Gornert, Vice President, Senior Investment Advisor, Canaccord Genui Wealth Management and Gornert Wealth Management, and welcome to the channel where we help you make sense out of your financial lives. Now today, I'm going to be joined by Canaccord Genuity Technology Analyst Robert Young to take a look at all things technology. But as usual, before we start, if you haven't subscribed, please do, and don't forget to drop a comment. Any sector you want covered, we'll try to get to it if we can. But let's uh, turn it over to Robert Young. Robert, thanks for joining us today. Hey, thanks for having me. No, I'm so glad you could join us. Now, you just uh, got off the, Can the 40th annual Canaccord Growth uh, Conference that you actually did virtually, which is a sign of the times in the world that we live in these days. Um, just walk a little bit, because I know that we talked a lot about uh, investors looking at a low interest rate environment right now and looking for growth opportunities and, and really some of the, you, you've made the case that the technology sector has really come through the whole COVID crisis relatively unscathed. Can you expand upon that just a little bit more? Yeah, sure. So uh, looking back over the last few months, the tech sector has done remarkably well, certainly better than I would have expected, uh, you know, looking over the edge of the cliff in, uh, in March. And um, you know, I would attribute it to a, a number of different things. First of all, the tech sector has a number of companies, a number of pieces inside of the sector that have not just, uh, you know, survived COVID-19. They've actually thrived. And uh, we we tried to assemble some of the themes. Some of them are generally, I think, most people have caught onto them. You know, the work from home theme, the um, uh, remote learning theme, uh, remote collaboration. Um, e-commerce, of course, uh, a number of areas of the tech sector has just done tremendously well. And then, I mean, if you, if you look a little bit beyond that, I think that the tech sector is becoming more of a, a defensive utility type of a sector. I'm not saying that it's becoming the defensive sector. It's good, always going to have a little higher risk because it's generally innovative new stuff. But it's taking on some of those characteristics because, I mean, if I look around the tools that I use in my daily life, um, you know, my iPhone is barely more than 10 feet away from me. Um, I can't live without Google. It's uh, central to, uh, you know, what I do here in the office. And um, Amazon has, you know, a big chunk of uh, my uh, my spending uh, now. So these companies have actually become more utility-like. In fact, I think if I ask my kids they'd probably rather see the water shut off than the wi-fi <laughs> probably I, I don't think that's a stretch to say that either no that, that's such a good point and that's one thing we i think we've all learned about this you know my, my son's 13 and uh through this whole covid crisis we've had you know school being online uh, we've had you know zoom class my wife does karate zoom classes i meet with clients online We've really seen that that shift in in, and I don't think it's going back anytime soon. That uh, that this there is a paradigm shift that I think has happened here. Certain things will get back to normal because we all like to get together and 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 and, and socialize. Uh, but you know your point about Amazon is so spot on. Now now on the Amazon point, you um, did make a comment that um, uh, Walmart is launching what they hope to be um, a competitor to to Amazon. Can we mm, talk a little yeah. bit about that. Well, they've been building a marketplace. I mean. The, the big news in the Canadian square would have been around a, a deal uh, or a partnership with Shopify where, you know, some of the vendors on Shopify were being encouraged to um, use the walmart.com marketplace. So, I mean, Amazon is the big bad, uh, uh, the big bad competitor to all of the e-commerce uh, companies. Uh, Shopify famous that they're saying they arm the rebels because they're providing technology and tools uh, to let smaller companies compete on an almost level playing field because Amazon has this unfair advantage that it gets from its fulfillment system and all of the mm -hmm. investments it's made in infrastructure so that it can deliver, you know, within one day in in some cases on the same day for free. And yeah. so, you know, Walmart is another very large company, obviously, that has the infrastructure that may be able to do that because it has stores all over North America, all over the world. And um, this marketplace is, uh, you know, uh, one area of comp competition that they're trying to pursue. Yeah, though, the, um, let's take a, a talk a little bit about valuations, because that's sometimes where we get some pushback on. They've had a great run on this. I know that, uh, yeah. you know, I've had Kevin Vandermeer on the show and, and we talk about valuations and uh, we've had uh, Javed Mirza on, on the show talking a little bit. Uh, yep. Let's talk and how you see valuations going forward here. 
Yeah. So uh, there's no one who's going to tell you that valuations aren't advanced. Uh, we do a summary of valuations in the, you know a biweekly uh, report we put out, and you know we're now at peak valuations for software companies, so, you know cloud-based software companies, SaaS mm-hmm. companies, and uh, so not only have they recovered valuations pre-COVID, but they're now you know, a little bit ahead of it. If you look at the Canadian market, even ahead because Shopify is such a big waiting. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, valuations are high. uh, But what I would say is that there's no fundamental reason for me to believe that that's going to stop because, uh, you know, looking back over the earnings season, we just saw in general companies reported very well in many cases Mm -hmm. better than we expected because a lot of analysts, you know, including myself, we took down estimates because, of the the expectation that the uh, the backdrop would be a lot uh, mm. more of a headwind, and um, you know companies have largely done well, and so I would think of you know Peter Lynch, um, you know the um, the famous uh, portfolio yep. manager, said once that you know more money had been lost waiting for a correction than in the correction <laughs> itself. I, I think that might be the case here. That's a good point. That's a good right? point because I don't know when it'll stop. And we know that these tech companies are winners through this current pandemic. And like you said at the very beginning, at the opening, I mean, it's a very smart comment. I mean, relative to the array of options you have when, you know, a U.S. Treasury bond or the, I think the 10-year rate is 0.6, 0.7%, yeah, which, you know, that's effectively, what, 100 times P.E.? Yeah. If you're if, if if that's what zero risk is worth, then, you know, how much are you, will, are you willing to pay for something that's growing 30%? Yeah, no, I mean, those are such good points. And I think that's what investors have to keep in mind, too, in mind too because I think sometimes we get caught up with uh, the market and the economy. Um, just, you know, you look outside and you go, oh, things are terrible, which they are. I mean, uh, and there's no question about that. But, you know, valuations are underpinned by earnings. And, uh, you know, I'll put up a link up there there to um, uh, Jeb Ed's last uh, video with me where we talk about some valuations just to, to put the technology space in some context of the broader markets. But I, th- I think it's well worth taking a look at that. Um, now, we, you just finished up the Canaccord Growth Conference, the 40th annual growth conference. Now, you guys yeah. did that virtually. So and yeah. that's the sign of the time. But how did do, how do technology guys work in the virtual world and how did it work? And, and was it better than you expected? Was it worse or, or what were, what were the, some of the things that came out? What were your favorite names that came out of that? Yeah, it, it was a lot better than expected. I think even, you know, going back in a couple of months ago, someone had told me that uh, our business could function with 95% of the people or more sitting at home uh, remotely. This is a relationship business. Yeah. And uh, it, it's gone, you know, remarkably well. Um, you know, Canaccord uh, has, uh, Canaccord Jewish has done a lot better than I would have expected. And, you know, it, the only option right now to do a conference is to do it virtually. And so yeah. there's that, but they're going remarkably well. Um, and so the, the 40th iteration of our growth conference, which is the biggest, normally it's held in, you know, muggy Boston. I've and, been there uh, in August. Yeah, we, awesome. In August. And we've got, <laughs> you know, great dinners and lots of mixers and, right. you know, an opportunity to share a cold beer with your, clo- your, your colleagues and your clients. And, and, and you'll never you know, have a crease, you'll never have a crease in your slacks in Boston in August because that's right. that, it's so humid. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I missed the lobster roll, but uh, I got to say that the, the conference was very efficient because yeah. you could very quickly move between sessions. Um, there was, there were more companies yeah. and, and normally, I think in, in Boston, we would have seven tracks running at the same time. This time, yeah. we had 12, and we had a lot of private companies. And so the number of meetings that we coordinated was, I mean, not quite double, but you know, significantly bigger than yeah. uh, previous versions. And so I would say that the virtual conference has a place, mm-hmm. uh, and you know, it went remarkably well. I guess we'll have to see... Uh, over the next couple of months when we start, you know, get feedback from our clients and get an understanding, you know, at the end of the day, you know, the value that people receive from the conference. But I, I'm pretty confident it'll, it will be very strong. So we're awesome. very happy with it. No, that, that's great. So any particular names that you're following now, like in the, from a Canadian perspective that, that, that you're excited about? I, I... Yeah, so my, my coverage is Canadian tech, anything that is um, across um either uh, Canadian listed or dual listed in Canada and the U.S. And uh, my coverage is pretty 
broad based because the technology sector in Canada is very broad. Uh, in the U.S., you would see uh, more um, sector specifically be a semiconductor analyst, an internet analyst, mm -hmm. uh, enterprise software analyst. I'm a, a technology analyst and all companies are becoming technology analysts. So it's a very broad coverage. First thing I would say. Mm -hmm. uh, we're seeing a pretty strong funding cycle, and so a lot of the time, um, I, uh, more off, more than normal, there's a lot of companies that I'm not allowed to talk about uh, right. because of compliance reasons. And uh, but I mean, a lot of the names that we've loved through the year um, have have done reasonably well. They're all in the software domain. Um, you know, the the companies that we uh, published on at the beginning of the year in our top picks report were Real Matters, Canaxis, and they've done, you know, very, very well, continue to like those names. Um, and, and, you know, just to sort of to, to dial in more on the thematic related to those, the, um, you know, Canaxis is supply chain software. Mm -hmm. And since the beginning of the pandemic, supply chains have been far more volatile, uh, very hard to ship freight uh, through the air. And yeah. so if you're uh, a supply chain manager of a large multinational, which is generally their customer base, the top 2000 companies in uh, their target verticals, which would be CPG and uh, electronics and yeah. pharma and such. And so it, it's, it's become a very, very valuable tool because you're trying to manage that volatility. And it's an, it is basically a um, scenario analysis tool where you can look at options uh, to better understand, um, you know, what is likely to drive a positive result. And then Real Matters is a company which provides uh, orchestration and a network around uh, U.S. mortgage origination, both refi and purchase. Right. And so in it's in Canada and the U.S., but the U.S. drives most of its revenue, 90% plus. And when you buy a house, uh, in general, uh, an appraiser has to validate the purchase price. Mm -hmm. And uh, at the end of the mortgage reservation, there's a, 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 an event where you get together to uh, verify title, transfer title, and right. um, sign all the documents. And, and Real Matters coordinates all of those things with a network of professionals that perform that. Mm -hmm. The banks really love it. But what's really driving it is uh, the very high level of refi because interest rates are so low. Right. There's an enormous That's number of you know, homeowners who have an incentive to refinance at a lower rate to yep. save money. And what's surprising is the level of purchase activity has been a lot stronger. And so that's turned out uh, those that's been a good driver for that business. Um, but in general, I, I would say that, you know, the tech sector across the board has done, you know, reasonably well. Um, yeah. I think it's one of those cases where the, the tide has lifted all boats and the, the magic of relative valuation has dragged up, you know, yeah. the sector. In and you also brought up a, a point in uh, in your um, biweekly uh, note that uh, some debt financing windows have been open to tech companies that haven't been opened in the past. You want to expand yeah. upon that a little bit? Because that's always been, you know, um, a bit difficult for, you know, always going to the equity markets, but you, there might be some other channels that have opened now that weren't there before. Yeah, I, I would just I would say that the uh, the tech sector is far more attractive in general mm -hmm. uh, to all types of um, uh, companies that provide debt or other types of capital. Um, I would say, you know, a, a, a Canadian technology company would uh, generally have uh, had a very rough time um, accessing debt from our highly conservative um, Canadian uh, banks. Uh, mm -hmm. The banks didn't give companies a lot of credit for intangible assets and for a software company I mean, most of their value is intangibles and mm -hmm. so we're starting to see that open up a little bit we're starting to see uh some more um uh, debt opportunities for smaller companies um you know uh, through through the the canadian banks but also uh some specialists are mezzanine and um uh sort of small uh, uh, debt providers yeah thanks so it, it's definitely uh, getting better. I think, you know, part of the point would be that, um, you know, the cost of, of debt is, is very low right now. Yeah. And so the ability to access that, I think in the long run, 
the 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 capital markets, um, the uh, the public markets are going to be the lowest cost of capital because it's where you have the most people competing yeah. to give you money. That's not the way it is right now. Uh, it, it's um, right now it's actually pr- likely cheaper on the private uh, mm-hmm. side. I think in the long run that should correct, but right now uh, the cost of debt is so low that it's. Um, it's, it's relatively easy to access capital. Now, interesting. Now, hey, just uh, just before we wrap up here, some of the broader strokes things that we were seeing going forward. You've got a note here that uh, 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 sorry, Apple and uh, Epic with Fortnite are um, yeah. are in a bit of a battle right now, and uh, we'll talk a little bit about that. And I also want to talk about much to this may of anyone who's got kids or anyone who has grandchildren or maybe even then the cells, but uh, uh, Halo Infinite is uh, is being delayed, uh, which is, um, yeah, and, and, is it, and actually there's more serious thing. Is that going to interrupt yeah. the whole console? Um, Great question. Yeah. yeah. I mean, if you're going to buy the next version of the Xbox, I think Halo would have been, you know, a, a pretty important piece. Yeah of the reason it may also be one of the reasons why you'd go with xbox over playstation we're mm-hmm. seeing you know a, a refresh in the uh, the console uh at you know the back end of the year here if things don't change um yeah it, it's definitely a, a surprise um one would have thought that microsoft would have been very focused on getting that out at the same time and then on uh apple and at epic it's interesting um apple is um you know, being painted as uh, a monopoly uh, increasingly because uh, it is competing with uh, companies that are on its platform. Uh, they now have their own arcade service. Yeah, uh, They charge 30% to uh, companies that are on its app store. And yeah. so Epic, which owns Fortnite, uh, when your kids buy those V-Bucks, uh, Epic has been saying, if you want <laughs> You want to Don't buy know them. what you're talking about. Yeah, no. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> if you want to buy them directly from us, we'll charge you seven. If you want to buy them through Apple, it's ten. Right. And you know, understandably, Apple doesn't too happy about that. And yeah. uh, but it's interesting. Most of it, I'm not a legal expert by any stretch, but a lot of the antitrust uh, laws in the U.S. are focused around uh, the consumer, the benefit to the consumer. Right. And so because Epic is you know willing to charge thirty percent lower. Right. Uh, you know, if you don't use Apple, Apple has a bit of a, you know, an issue there because uh, the consumer has to pay more if it goes through the Apple infrastructure. You know, and Apple is competing with, um, you know, app providers like Spotify. You know, you've got Apple Music; right. they're competing against Spotify, and so it, it's it, it'll be interesting to see how that develops because you know Apple has this um, has this um, culture of doing everything themselves i mean they yep. just, they're back doing their own chips now they uh, were using intel before uh they own all of their software they used to manufacture internally they don't do that for a long time but they you yeah. know through a lot of the com- company's history they've done most of ever almost everything inside of their uh, service and product stack themselves yeah and so it'll be interesting to see how it develops the other thing, uh, just on, on the Apple, is that uh, they're rolling out the the bundles, uh, looking for more recurring revenue. I expect, which is logical, but uh, yeah. I mean that's their next. From what I'm seeing, is their their next major um, push in, into that sector. Yeah, I, I just, yeah, and there was a little bit of worry about Peloton there. People were suggesting that yeah. Peloton might be at risk because of the ability that Apple could bundle in healthcare and health uh, services. Right. So I mean, it, it it's it's. Apple is a tremendously powerful company because it has an enormous uh, installed base. It knows a lot about you. It has your credit card number. It has a good relationship with you. And it has power in the market to bundle other, you know, competitive services. And so, again, it's it's another point uh, uh, in that same argument that Apple is, you know, getting, you know, a little bit monopolistic. Yeah. Well, hey, why don't we wrap it up there? Thank you so much for joining me. Please, I'd, I'd love to have you back again in the future. But uh, this is Robert Young, technology analyst with Canaccord. Thanks, Robert. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thanks Bye. for having me on.